So that means tonight what we're going to do is we're going to finish off uh, our series called Secrets uh, of the Supernatural. So this is the last lesson that I'm going to give, and I pray that it's been a blessing. I pray that it's been a help to you, and uh, so it, yeah, amen. God's good. We are living in the supernatural. How many believe that? Shout amen. We are supernatural beings, and so therefore we've got to live in the realm of the supernatural. So what we've been trying to do is we've been trying to give you some concepts about what that looks like. We've had six conversations. We've talked about the secret to the supernatural person of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about the secret to supernatural conversations, the secret to supernatural gifting, the secret to supernatural tests, the secret to supernatural assignments. Last week, we talked about the secret to supernatural peace and how to deal with um, combative people at times. And I pray that was a help to you. Uh, But tonight I want to wrap it. And all of these messages you can get on the Christian Center app or the website. Either one of those, just download that app if you haven't done it yet. Because sometimes, how many know you got to listen to a message more than one time to really get what you need out of it, right? Sometimes you got to read the same verse, the same chapter, the same passage uh, more than one time. And so download the app. You can uh, re-listen to these, take notes on the app, anything that you want to do about that. But we're going to put a cap on it tonight, and we're going to talk about the secret to supernatural warfare. How many know we are in a battle tonight? Can I get an amen? We are in a battle. In specific, some of you are in a very personal battle right now. And so tonight, I want to just give you some concepts. You can go ahead and bring up the house lights. I'm really not going to start off with the text. we got a lot of verses that we're going to go through tonight. Um, but I want, to, I want to help you understand what it looks like when you are fighting a supernatural battle. Let me just go ahead and ask, how many are in a battle right now? Come on, let me see you raise your hand. Okay. I mean, all of us are. Either you're in a battle, you're coming out of a battle, or you're going into a battle. One of the three, okay? It's just part of, it's just part of life, and it's just part of really kind of going through life. We're in, and it's okay to be in battles. It's not, it's, it's, it's not a bad thing. It doesn't mean you're a sinner. It doesn't mean you're backslid. It doesn't mean you're immature. It doesn't mean you don't know what you're doing. I'm going to know all of us have battles, right? We do. And we know that because the scripture said, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, we know this well. We know that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and against the uh, rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so most of the time, the warfare that we're talking about is clothed in crisis. You know, we all go through these crises in life. And I want you to know something, and I I really feel strongly, even as I was coming into service tonight, I felt this on my heart. Every crisis has an end. I said every crisis has an end. Amen. And I feel like somebody's crisis is about to come to an end. Amen. I felt that so strongly in my spirit as I was walking into the sanctuary tonight that your crisis is about to come to an end. Amen. And I know that it seems as though it is a never-ending thing, but we've got to understand that it's in the crisis that we find a classroom a classroom in which God is teaching us. He's teaching us about himself. He's teaching us about ourselves. He's teaching us about the world around us. It's a classroom. Now, I don't know how you did in school, but maybe you didn't get good grades, but I'm telling you, when God puts you in the classroom, how many know you want to pass the test, amen? (laughs) Because if you don't pass the test, guess what God's going to do? He's going to give you the same one again. All right, got to go through it again. And so when we talk about crises, uh, amen, we know that every crisis has an end. That's why Paul could say this. Uh, He said, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are cast down, but we are not destroyed. And so God is teaching you some things. And so tonight, 
What I want to do is I want to talk about warfare. How, how do we face this? How do we get through this and have a, have a conversations? Now, the psalmist said this in Psalm 144. He said, blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Amen. Church, listen, I don't know from where you came in your background, but I'm telling you, if you're going to win this thing, I'm going to know you're going to have to fight to win. Oh, come on. I said, you're going to have to fight to win. Amen. You're going to have to get some tenacity about you. You're going to have to get some uh, spiritual guts about you. You're going to have to get some chutzpah about you. Can I use that word? You're going to have to get something deep inside of you that says, man, I don't care how intense this battle get. I don't care how much I got to sweat, how much I got to cry, how dirty I get. I am in it to win it by the grace of God. Amen. He teacheth my hands to war. My fingers, amen, the Bible said, are taught to fight. In other words, God wants us to have this level of warfare tenacity within us because when you get in there, you're going to discover some stuff about yourself, amen, that you never knew. So let's, 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 let's dive into this tonight, okay? Let's dive into this. The first thing that I want to share with you is this. When we talk about warfare, and this is, this is not going to be earth-shattering stuff. It's not going to be, you know, deep, but I'm just going to give you some, some truths that I feel like I'm supposed to. Number one, you've got to choose to win. You've got to choose to win. The Bible said, 1 Corinthians 15 and 57, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the deal. You don't always get to choose the battles you fight. Sometimes you're fighting battles that somebody else caused. Let me say that again. Sometimes you're fighting battles that somebody else caused, right? And even though you may not get to choose the battles you fight, guess what? You can always choose to win the battles that you fight. In fact, you've got to choose because here's the deal, my friend. God has already chosen the end from the beginning. God has chosen for you to have the victory. Do you believe it? Shout amen. Look at somebody say, you're going to win. Okay, now say it like you really mean it. You're going to win. Glory to God. Amen. Because we know what the Bible said, that Jesus has already given us the victory. And so I can stand here tonight and I can 100% assuredly tell you without a doubt in my mind that when you make up your mind to win, that by the grace of God, you will win every single battle, no matter what anybody tells you and no matter what the devil tries to convince you of in Jesus, you have already won the victory, but you got to make up your mind. Now, you got to make up your mind. I know this sounds simple, but sometimes, and I've been guilty of it, we get in the middle of the battle, we think, oh, I can't do this anymore. Have you ever said that to yourself? I just can't take another day. Now, about 20% of you are honest with me tonight. I can't take just another day. What is that doing? What we are doing is, we, no, you have got to make up your mind. I am going to win. This is crucial because nothing else I say tonight is going to matter if you don't think that you're going to win. You got to make up your mind. You have got to be convinced Isaiah 43 said that the Lord created thee, O Jacob, he that formed thee, O Israel. He said, fear not, I've redeemed you, I've called you by name, you're mine, and when you pass through the waters, I'm going to be with you through the rivers, they're not going to overflow thee. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and neither will the flame kindle upon you. Now, is that a promise of God or what? Amen. And I think sometimes what we do is, and I'll get to this later, but we allow the battle to really get inside of our head. And we allow what is going on to get inside of our head. And when we get the battle inside of our head, rather than the outcome inside of our head, the battle becomes bigger than what it should be because whatever you think about the most, amen, it becomes larger and your focus enlarges that which you are looking at. So the fact is you don't have to look, oh, come on somebody, I'm preaching to somebody right now. I know this is Wednesday, but can I preach a little bit? Is that all right? Amen. Amen. 
You're looking at the battle right now and you're only seeing all of the intense warfare and the artillery of the enemy that is being shot at you. And all you do is think about daily all the hurts and the pains and all the things that you are facing. And the Lord is saying to you, get your eyes off of the battle and begin to look at the outcome and realize on the other side of this battle is a victory that is bigger than what you have ever imagined that is going to enlarge your borders and enlarge your territory and enlarge your authority and make you walk into a land that you have never possessed. You've got to look at the promised land and not the giant that is standing between you and the land that God's given to you. Glory to God. you got to make up your mind. You've got to decide that tonight, right here, right now, I am going to win. Every person is going to struggle. We all do. The steps of a good man, God has already declared, they're ordered by the Lord. Though he fall, sometimes, how many know you fall in the midst of the battle? Come on, we do. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Amen. And so therefore, when you make up your mind, even though you fall or even though you falter and become weak, you've got the strong arm of Jehovah that is reaching down to you and is going to pick you up and put you right back on the path. Listen, 100% of you tonight are going to win in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Man, I'm fired up tonight. I'm sorry. I really am. Because I am, I am very, I am tired of the enemy, the devil manipulating the minds of God's people and convincing them that they cannot win. And so therefore we go through life beaten down and moping as if we are, you know, just some, no, my God, we are a child of the most high God. And I've already been guaranteed the outcome of my battle. So therefore I'm going to walk, I'm going to live, I'm going to run, I'm going to fly, amen, as if there is no tomorrow, knowing that the battle is coming to an end, and I'm going to fly out of this thing better than I've ever been. Glory to God. So you've got to choose to win. You've got to choose to win. You've got to stay focused on the fact that God has a beautiful future plan for you. He told the Israelites, Numbers 14, he said, if the Lord delight in us, he's going to bring us into this land. He's going to give it to us, a land that floweth with milk and honey. And so therefore, in the midst of this battle, you've got to stay focused on your future. Now, here's the the deal. People evaluate you according to how you have performed in the past. God evaluates you based on what he has planned for your future. Amen. And so if God is planning my future, then I need to be focused on that plan and not where I am at the current moment. So you got to choose to win. Now, let me move on. Number two, battles are the enemy's resistance to your miracle. You see, the last thing the devil wants you to do is experience a miracle. Because the moment you walk into the miraculous, that's the moment that you're going to discover your destiny and you're going to be released to really do that which you are created to do. And so the enemy is going to do everything he can to resist the miracle that God has planned for you. Now, let me ask you tonight, how many believe we serve a God of miracles? Can I get a raucous amen? <laughs> amen. A God of miracles. And the enemy hates that. He hates it. He hates the miraculous And so he's going, these battles that you are fighting right now is only a resistance of the enemy to your miracle. Now, how how will the enemy do that? Well, sometimes uh, he'll use people to resist our miracle. 
I mean, the greatest miracle that ever took place was Jesus going to the cross. Amen. The redemption of the sins of mankind, that is a miracle. But guess what? Peter, when Jesus began to talk about going to Jerusalem, Peter said, no, not so, Lord, and tried to persuade. He even rebuked Jesus. He rebuked him and said, no, don't go. And Jesus had to look at him, and you know what he said? He said, get thee behind me, Satan, because Satan was using Peter to stand in the way of the miracle of Jesus going to the cross. Let me tell you something, church, right now, you better open up your eyes uh, because there's some demonic influences around you that are being used to resist the miracle that God's trying to do in your life. Some of them have a sweet face on, have a sweet little voice. Praying for you. Yeah, who are you praying to? That's what I want to know. Praying for you, call me. No, don't call her. Don't call him. He may say that he's got your best interest in mind, but he is a resistance to the miracle that God wants. You better open your eyes. Man, I feel that so strongly tonight. You better open. The enemy will use people to resist your miracle. He will use pain to resist your miracle. You know, Paul... I got so much to talk about tonight. I'm going to try to really hurry. But Paul had this thorn in the flesh, the Bible said, 2 Corinthians 12, had this thorn. It was, it was a physical, it was a physical pain. And, and, and I can't really dive into this deep tonight, but that, that physical pain did not come from God. God does not give you sickness. Oh, the Lord just made me sick to make me humble. That's a lie. He is the God who heals. Come on, somebody. And so this pain, the Bible said, is a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Why did Satan bring this physical pain into the the life of Paul, this thorn in the flesh? Well, the Bible said, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. In other words, God was giving Paul revelation after revelation after revelation, and God was showing him things that he would have never learned sitting in a rabbinical classroom. And so therefore, the devil saw all of these revelations and said, "Uh uh-uh, I'm going to try to stand in the way of the revelations that God is giving through a physical pain. Let me tell you something, church. Amen. If the devil can inflict your body with pain to limit what God can do. That's exactly what he's going to try to do. And tonight we stand against that in the name of Jesus and declare that he is the God that heals. And I rebuke any physical affliction that the devil is using to inhibit that which God wants to do in your life. In the name of Jesus, break it right now. I said, break it right now because it's of the enemy. He's resisting your miracle. I really believe there's there's some miracles that God has in store for us. And the enemy uses pain to try to stand in the way of that. He may use not just people, not just pain. Sometimes he uses principalities. I mean, here's Daniel. He's praying. He's praying for a vision. Daniel chapter number, I mean, it's 14. I'm sorry, chapter 10. He's praying for 21 days. Now, when the angel came, he told Daniel, he said, Daniel, he said, God heard your prayer day one. But for 21 days, he said, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days. Now, who's the prince of the kingdom of Persia? It is a demonic influence that was over the geographical region of Persia. Now, let me just sidetrack and say, I do believe there are demonic assignments that are given to geographical regions within the world around us. I believe there's a demonic oppression that is over South Bend and this entire area. And I believe that we've got to continue to take the authority against that because there is spiritual warfare that is going on. And so what is it? This is the principality of the, king, uh, of the prince of the kingdom of Persia that was with, with, with withstanding and resisting uh, what the miracle that God wanted to give uh, unto Daniel. Some of you are fighting a spiritual battle right now, and you don't understand why you can't sleep at night, why you are struggling, uh, amen, in your emotional, soulical person. Uh, I'm telling you what it is. It is a principality of the enemy, uh, and, and I'm going to get to it later, but let's just go ahead and say it now. 
now. You got to rise up, say the name of Jesus, and take authority over that principality uh, and crush its power over you uh, because the devil does have no power over any of you if you are a child uh, of the Most High God. I want to be careful here, but I'm going to tell you something. The devil is causing so much stress and anxiety within the hearts and the minds of God's people. And I know the world that, you know, they want to they diagnose and all. Sometimes we got to call it for what it is. There's a demonic spirit that is trying to trouble the hearts and minds of the people of God. And we got to step up and say, uh uh-uh, uh, no more. In Jesus' name, I am not going to give in to that principality. Because he's resisting the miracle. So the battle you are fighting right now is resistance to the miracle that God wants to bring into your life. He's getting ready. In fact, I know that there is a miracle that is about to give birth into your life. I mean, you look at Jesus. He, the greatest, really the greatest miracle, obviously, when he was born, look what happened. Immediately, Herod got up in, in Matthew chapter 2 and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coast thereof. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to kill the miracle. He wanted to kill the miracle. That's exactly what the enemy's trying to do in your He's trying to kill the miracle. But we're not going to let it happen by the name of Jesus. We're going to win. Amen? Recognize the battle. It's a resistance. Now, number three, you've got to understand your enemy as well. You've got to understand the nature of your enemy. Now, I, I am not one to stand up here and... And, and, and give credit and glory to the devil. I hate him. He's a loser. He's a liar. He is a louse. How many L's can I use tonight? He knows that he is already defeated. And some, sometimes what we do, <laughs> a lot of people give more credit to the devil than what he deserves. You know, I... I uh, I grew up in, in, in churches sometimes where testimonies were, uh, it glorified the devil more than it did God. You know, devil's been on my tail. Devil's been doing this. Devil, quit talking about the devil. Man. I think I told you a story one time about a lady. She was in church, and she was the most positive lady that, I mean, she never had anything negative to say about absolutely anybody. I don't care, I don't care what you did to her. She would always have a good word to say about you. And so a couple of young guys thought, man, we're going to, we got to get this lady. We got to trick her somehow. So they thought, you know, what we'll do is we'll ask her what she thinks about the devil. Because surely she's got something to say bad about the devil. So they went up to her and said, hey, sister, what do you think about the devil? And she said, well, he sure is a hard worker. (laughs) Yeah, he is. And so I'm not here to give, but let me tell you something. You've got to understand the nature of your enemy. You've got to understand where this is coming from because sometimes, you know, the Bible says we are not ignorant of his devices. And if we are ignorant of what the enemy is doing, then we will not be prepared to stand against that which the enemy brings to us. Now, the Bible said we are to be sober. We are to be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He is a supernatural being of an angel that was once the prince of angels in heaven. The devil is an angel. You've got to understand that. I think we all know that. His name was Lucifer. He was the chief worship leader in heaven. And so he knows what authority is all about, which is why when the devil wants to destroy something, he goes after the authority figure in that place. If the devil wants to destroy the home, guess what? He's going to go after the dad. If the devil wants to go after the church, he's going to go after the pastor. He's going to, because the devil hates authority. He hates authority. And that's what got him kicked out of heaven. He was kicked out of heaven because he hates authority. That's why rebellion, the Bible said, is as the sin of witchcraft. Man, I could, I, I could go off on that as to why that is. 
We've got to understand the rebellious spirit mm, that is in this nation right now. And all you've got to do is get on social media and all you've got to do is, you know, see these kids that are in public schools uh, and the rebellious spirit. I'm talking five and six-year-olds that are filled with such a spirit uh, of rebellion. Amen. They're not getting that from television. They're getting that from the spirit uh, that is behind the programming uh, that is instilling in the hearts and the minds of our children uh, that they don't have to listen to authority. Uh, that is of the the devil. Man, I know this is not popular preaching, but I'm telling you, it is the truth. There is such a spirit of rebellion that is in this nation right now. I got to just be me. I got to let my voice be heard. I got to do this. I got to. No, you don't. Sometimes you got to sit down, shut up, and listen to what you're being told. Because the spirit of rebellion is gripping the United States of America. And you that are working in the public schools, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You that are working in the schools, teaching in the schools, driving bus for the schools, you deal with it every day. You are up against a warfare, and I salute you as a man and woman of God that is anointed. You keep carrying the light in the public school because there's a spirit of rebellion that needs to be broken by the Holy Ghost that lives inside of you. Amen. Now, so he hates rebellion. I mean, he hates authority. That's why he's rebellious. Isaiah 14, how are you falling from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground? You said in your heart, I'm going to ascend into heaven. I'm going to exalt my throne above the stars of God. I'm going to sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. That's, that's why he's cast out of heaven. Jesus said in Luke 10, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So the, the, the devil hates authority. He's going to go after your authority figure. But also the devil is desperate. And I, I mean this. I, I really believe there is an uptick in satanic attack and assault on the people of God. Anybody besides me, have you seen? Have you seen it? That's because the devil's desperate. He's desperate. He knows the Bible said, and it's not going to be on the screen, Revelation 12. He said, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. He said, the devil's come down to you having great wrath because he knows he's got but a short time. The devil knows his time is running out. And so I believe he has ratcheted up and intensified the attacks upon the church, upon the home, upon your heart, upon uh, marriages, anxiety, stress. He knows he's trying to destroy as many lives as possible while he has the opportunity. He knows his final destruction. He knows his, his demise. So he's desperate. But now, number three, you got to understand this. The devil despises God. Now you say, well, pastor, of course he does. We know that but that's why he's attacking you so intently. You say, wait a minute. No. You know why he's attacking you? Because God is the one that he cannot win against, and he knows that. But if he can attack the crowning creation of God, his child, and try to destroy you, it is as if he's got one up on God. In his mind, he's attacking you because he hates God. You understand that? It should give you a perspective. Now, now, what that should do, uh, if you're under attack and you're walking through warfare, that ought to cause you to rejoice. Uh, amen. You must be doing something right or the devil wouldn't be messing with you. Right? If the devil's messing with you, that means you must be on track uh, because he hates what God, uh, he hates the fact that God loves you. He hates the fact that God has redeemed you. He hates the fact that you're walking in the favor of God. He hates the fact that you're blessed. And so anytime you begin to step in the favor and the blessing of God, you better believe that the archer of the enemy is going to pull back his bow and he's going to shoot and try to hit you square in the heart. But I'm telling you tonight, do not back away from the favor of God because anytime the enemy ratchets up the, the attack, I believe the grace of God, amen, is endowed upon you with an un, 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 unlimited favor that's going to give you the power to withstand the the attack of the enemy. The devil hates God, and that's why he hates you. <laughs> Man, I'm sorry if this is too negative tonight, but I'm just being real with you. You've got to understand, this battle that you're fighting is not an accident. 
And really, that's what I feel like I got. It's not an accident. It's not just, well, well, this just happened. No, this is spiritual. This is supernatural warfare. And this is why, because you are walking under the favor of God. Now, the, 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 the attack of the enemy, it's his way of attacking God. And that's why James said, my brethren, count it all joy. <laughs> joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, number four. You gotta understand the, 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 the nature of the enemy. And, and there's so much more I could talk about with that. I just don't have the time to do it. Because I wanna tell you, you gotta understand, number four, the tactics of the enemy. You see, what he's gonna try to do is deceive you. He's a deceiver, he's a liar. We know that. Jesus said, John chapter 8, he said, you are of your father the devil, the lust of your father you're going to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not on the truth. Why? Because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and he is the father of it. The devil cannot tell the truth even if he wanted to. And so therefore, what he's attempting to do is deceive you and lie to you about who you are, about who God is, and about who those around you are. And he does that by casting doubt. He starts, I mean, the underlying goal is deception. He wants, you he wants you deceived, but he does that by casting doubt into your mind. He did that from the beginning. He came up to Eve in the Garden of Eden. What did he say? He said, well, hath God really said? Did God say that? What the enemy wants to do is cause you to doubt what God has said in his word. Because if you doubt God's word, you have no faith because your faith is grounded in the word of God. And doubt and faith cannot coexist. So the devil knows that if he can get you all, well, you say, well, pastor, you know, that verse is for somebody else. It may not be just for me. That is doubt from the devil. How many believe every single verse in the Bible is for absolutely anybody that will have the faith to step up and say, yes, I believe this is for me. Somebody shout amen. Listen, we all deal with that. I deal with doubt. We all do. It's a very real thing. It's a, you know, we, 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 <laughs> we pray something and then we walk away. And I've done this here recently. I pray something and then I walk away and all of a sudden I get, you know, my mind is filled with doubt at that. Now I have to come back and say, no, listen, I prayed that. God said that. I believe it. I am not going to believe my symptoms or my circumstances. I'm not going to believe what anybody else tells me. I'm not going to believe what I see on the news. I am going to believe what God has said. Here's why. Because God is not a man. Numbers 23, he is not a man that he should lie, and neither is he the son of man that he should repent. Hath he spoke, hath he said, and will he not do it? Hath he spoke, and will he not make it good? If God said it, you can guarantee it will happen. Somebody shout amen. Amen, it's going to happen. He cannot. It's impossible. As impossible as it is for the devil to tell the truth, it is just as impossible for God to lie. And so therefore, everything he has said, he is going to bring to pass in your life. Everything. And you cannot doubt. You cannot doubt. Because that is the tactic of the enemy. He will attempt for you to doubt, and he will distract you with those doubts. Now, how many know, and I have, I have a short attention span. How many know it's very easy to get distracted? Look at your neighbor and say, pay attention. <laughs> you can't get distracted. Now, number five, and I, I really am, I'm trying to hurry here. Am I helping somebody? Because number five, you've got to recognize the arsenal you have. You've got to understand the arsenal that you have in, your, in, in supernatural warfare. And the number one, <laughs> the number one weapon you have is the word of God. The word of God. That's it. Prayer, supplication, yes, comes, but you've got to have the word first and foremost. 
Because the word of God, Hebrews 4 said, is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now, notice the word of God divides your soul and your spirit. What is your soul? Your soul is your emotions. Your spirit is your God consciousness. And so the reason that the Word of God is your number one weapon is because the Word of God causes you to get out of your feelings and into your faith. Because if you try to fight this battle by your feelings, guess what? One day you're going to be feeling on top of the world, and the next day you're going to be feeling as if you're in the molly grubs. And so therefore, it's when you are down in your emotions that the Word of God says, "Uh uh-uh, nope, we're not going to listen to our emotions. We're going to listen to what the Word of God says. And the Bible rises up within you. And as the Bible rises up within you, your faith becomes strong and you're able to fight the battle. Oh, listen tonight, the greatest thing you can do is step up and begin to quote the Word of God because the devil hates the Word of God. He hates it. That's why Jesus used it against him. It is written. (laughs) You got to know it. You've got to verbalize it. You've got to speak it. You've got to let it out. You've got to sometimes shout it if you need to. You've got to let your voice be heard. Because when your voice speaks the authority of the Word of God... You are letting the devil know (laughs) that there is authority within you that does not come from you, but it comes from a word that was spoken by the creator of the universe. And the creator of the universe made everything that is and that ever will be by what he said. And when you speak the word of God, you are creating your world from this point based on what God has said to you and through you. Somebody shout amen. So when you are fighting the battle, (laughs) you are fighting the battle of sickness, amen, what you do is you do not accept it, but rather you say no, amen, by his stripes ye were healed, is what Peter said. That is what the word of God says, you speak it, amen. If you are fighting the battle of financial insecurity, you simply say, my God, Philippians 4, will supply all of my God. My God, my God, he's my God tonight. Amen. He is a personal God tonight that is concerned about every single intricate detail of your life. He loves you more than what you could ever imagine. Somebody shout amen. Man, I needed to say that. My God. Why did Paul say that? I think it's so you know he's your God tonight. He's not a God. He is my God. Hallelujah. He is a personal God that will supply all of your need. You're fighting discouragement. You get up and say what Paul said to the Romans. He said, no, no, I love this. No, no, no. (laughs) In all things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us us. You're fighting the battle of insecurity. What do you do? (laughs) You simply stand up and say what God said in Deuteronomy chapter number 28, uh, that the Lord is going to make you the head and not the tail. You're going to be above and not beneath. Uh, Amen. Let me just say this right now. The insecurity is one of the biggest tricks and, and, and tools of the enemy to make you feel like you are less than somebody else. Let me tell you right now, let's get that lie and let's send it back to hell from whence it came. You are not less than anybody else. I don't care where you came from. I don't care what you look like. I don't care what your grade was. I don't care what you did in sixth grade. It doesn't matter. Amen. You are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. And start acting like you're a child of God and stop comparing yourself to Sissy Sue over here because she may be prettier than you, but who cares? You got a spirit inside of you that's a spirit of a warrior that's going to step up and say, hey, I am no longer going to live like I'm the tail. I'm at the head of the class and I'm there because of the grace and the favor of Almighty God. You hear what I'm saying? I'm talking about getting serious about the warfare you're in. Start using the tool of the Word of God. Speak it and believe it. you got to change your mindset. 
to that of an overcomer. If you think you're defeated, you will be defeated. If you think you're going to lose, you will lose. You just will. You've got to begin to think like an overcomer. And you've got to begin to take authority in the name of Jesus over the devil and realize, I don't care where you are. Man, you may be standing in the middle of Walmart and the devil starts attacking your mind. Go ahead and say it out loud. I rebuke you, devil, in the name of Jesus. Guy behind me, you might get scared and run away, but you've, (laughs) he may need, maybe that's why you're rebuking him. Who knows? He may, (laughs) the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous, they run into it. They're safe. They're safe. God's highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. So this is what I want to close with, and I'm just going to make this statement. I'll get out of your way. The battle you're in is for a reason. There's a reason you're fighting tonight. There's a reason because there's a miracle that God wants to do in your life, and the devil is trying his best to resist that miracle. But here's the other thing. Not only does your battle there for a reason, it's also there for a season. Just a season. This this too will pass. This will pass. I know it seems like it's going to last forever, but no, it's going to pass. And you're going to win. You've got to make up your mind that you're going to win. And tonight, I pray that what I have said has in some way built faith within your heart to say, oh God, I'm not going to lose. I'm going to win. Amen. How many believe you're winners tonight? Let me hear you shout amen. Come on, stand to your feet.